Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this series 2022, the ongoing biennial organized by the Social Practice Lab at Duke University. My name is Pedro Lash, and I'm an artist and the director of the Social Practice Lab. And um, every week we've been having um, a guest who is a, an international curator working on these types of international exhibits, not just biennials, but other types of shows. And we thought it would be a really, really uh, important time to address this given how the pandemic has challenged, you know, global culture and, and the very mechanisms in which these shows work in addition to the questions of the importance or relevance of art, art making, curatorial practice in such dire times, right? Candice um, Hopkins is a curator and, and writer of Thingit Descent, originally from Whitehorse, Yukon. She's the senior curator of the Toronto Biennial of Art and the co-curator of the 2018 Site Santa Fe Biennial. And she was part of the curatorial team for Documenta 14, in, which would happen in Athens, Greece, as well as Castle, Germany, where Documenta always happens every five years. And uh, she's also the co-curator of a major exhibition called Sakahan, International Indigenous Art, and many other um, uh, exhibitions, some of which we will talk about today. Um, Candice is also a, a scholarly researcher. We've actually collaborated. Some of you may know her through the Art of the MOOC series that where she lectured uh, with me on the experiments with sound. So she's done a lot of work on sovereignty, sound, uh, and, and just research connected to indigenous art globally and art that goes far beyond that. Uh, it's great to have you here, Candice, um, and uh, glad you could carve a little bit of time to out to be with us in your busy schedule. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be in dialogue with you. And so well, how about we start talking about uh, the biennial topic? You know, you've been involved in quite a few of them. Uh, currently, you could uh, tell us a little bit about how the work with the Toronto Biennial is going, but also other things that come to mind in terms of how it connects to what you did at, you know, Site Santa Fe and, and, and other places, you know, this, this whole idea of the recurrent show, uh, the massive scale of most of these biennials, um, it would be great to hear your, your take on that. Yeah, thank you for that question. I guess I would say that my start in thinking about these forms of exhibitions was through Sagahan, uh, which was an exhibition intended to take place every five years, and that's at the National Gallery of Canada. And in fact, the last one, Abadakini, just uh, closed. And I think that the period of time between the first two were actually seven years. So I think sometimes time stretches, of course, sometimes it, it's collapsed. But part of the reason that we wanted to organize an exhibition like Sagahan was one, to think about uh, Indigenous art really as a global movement, of which it is. We can go into that more, more in depth, but also to think you know, what potential a kind of iterative exhibition offers. Uh, one thing that we thought about as organizers is how the exhibitions could actually build on one another. I think for a while there was a trend with biennials, especially when they're made up of entirely new teams um, to kind of either completely just try to dismantle the exhibition that came before or do something entirely different. So it, it almost seemed like biennials for a period of time, especially in the 90s, were most uh, vehicles for forgetting, you know, or like completely uh, generating, you know, new ideas, which I think is, is fine, but we were instead thinking about how these kind of recurrent exhibitions can draw a thread through and that definitely informed the work that we did as part of the Site Santa Fe biennials. I was involved with three of them and the series is called Sightlines, as well as how we're shaping uh, the Toronto Biennial of Art, which is a bit unique uh, because when we started in 2019, um, well, before that, in fact, two years before, we actually remain as the same curatorial team of five, in fact, including um, those curators working in edu education and public programs because we didn't want to sort of re replicate the usual hierarchy um, between public programs and education and those who are working on the exhibition. And that was a kind of learning that I took from my work with Documenta as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's some initial thoughts and why I think it's really important to think, and I think people are, are thinking critically about the structure of biennials, you know, what they offer, 
how they are areas of, of like deep scholarly research, not just necessarily focused on, on showing, you know, the, the new, for example, or things that are underrepresented or not known. Yeah. And in fact, you know, I, I want to make sure people know that the Sakahan had a great catalog. It in fact includes one of the writings that you have in it addresses this is issue of amnesia, right? Which is, I think, a really great contribution to this series. You know how how when you bring a new team every time and when there's literally literal bans of not allowing the same artists to come back, you know, uh, the 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 amnesia effect is it quite can be quite enormous, you know, uh, and it's. And it's also something that touches on on one of the so-called great myths of the avant-garde in Western art, right? This idea of the of, of originality and nov innovation, right? Um, uh, which is often just tradition masquerading as, as innovation, you know, uh, but uh, but a tradition that doesn't see itself as such, you know. So, so I I mean one of the things that I that I from the beginning really appreciate about about Sakahan and also about your work in general is how it challenges expectations of, uh, so if we can kind of linger a little bit more on this concept of the indigenous, you know, uh, for the, from the very beginning for you, this is, this has always been a global concept to you, you know, and, and a concept that can't be taken for granted to mean one thing, you know, it's constantly being questioned, uh, and the way the artists that you brought do that themselves, because uh, can you perhaps share some of the strategies that you've used in, in your various shows to, to use this concept to challenge world culture more broadly? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, some of my thinking came earlier uh, from an exhibition that predated Sagahan. It was called Close Encounters, The Next 500 Years. And it was really looking or trying to radically reframe um, perceptions, let's say, of indigeneity, which are often fixed in the past based on a lot of misunderstanding presumptions. You know, the violence of colonialism means that oftentimes our history and our very contemporary presence is only kind of known through fragments, right? Even to ourselves sometimes. Um, so we wanted to kind of speak back to that. But when I started doing research on Close Encounters, there was I went back to the 1960s. I went back to specific indigenous political movements, in particular, you know, the formation of the World Council on Indigenous Peoples, uh, which the late uh, Grand Chief George Emanuel was a part of. And he authored this really important book called The Fourth World, an Indian Reality. And in that book, I was really struck with a few things. One, they had a network and they were making that network at that point in time. He said that, in the late 60s, all through the 70s, of course, the, his whole political career, he was inspired by indigenous resistance movements in Tanzania. So he went there and they shared, you know, their experiences, what they were doing. He was um, inspired by uh, the Sami Action Group in Sápmi, uh, Northern Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Western Russia, and the actions that they were taking on to have the recognition of Sami rights as human rights within Norway in particular, and their fight against the building of a massive hydroelectric dam. Um, this, was, this was the 70s, so they were traveling there. And so they, this was the emergence actually of the World Council of Indigenous Peoples that then led to the founding of the UN Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which people call UNDRIP, which is such a weird acronym. But what was fascinating to me as well is that most of those people were also artists. So artists were very much at the heart of these early political movements for indigenous people. And what they were trying to, art to articulate, going you know, above and beyond uh, colonial nation states was the idea that you could have this network of indigenous nations and use the leverage that the U United Nations might offer, for example, um, as a way to kind of force, in fact, um, the colonial nations to recognize their rights as not only human rights, but also as forms of cultural sovereignty. Um, so when I was doing that research, I was realizing that um, there were a lot of, that this kind of network hadn't really been represented before in an exhibition. Um, oftentimes 
the kind of earlier exhibitions that were looking at uh, international indigeneity were, were tethered to, to single language groups or single kind of relationships to, to original colonizers like the UK. So there were exhibitions, of course, with artists from the United States, Canada, Otavaroa, New Zealand, Australia, but we didn't, we thought that that might be feeding into those colonial histories too much. So we wanted to, to really um, expand that. And so then when it came to work on Sagahan uh, together with Greg Hill and Christine Lalonde, which was, it originates, originated out of the Indigenous Department at the National Gallery of Canada that was established in 2007. So before I, before I joined, um, it was actually the, the former director of the gallery at the time who had this idea. He said, why couldn't we do an exhibition that was kind of like Documenta and that there's a really long research and gestation period um, for Indigenous art and I, of course, really thought of this as an opportunity to sort of show how broad these um, geopolitical poles are, let's say. Um, we decided that we wanted to um, focus, to go back at least 10 years and focus on artists who had had major impacts in their communities, as well as we ones that we thought were, were starting to do that within their practice. So it was a gigantic exhibition. There were I believe 83 artists from, let's say 16 colonial nations, but many, many more indigenous nations. We did a lot of reframing with that show, some of which was challenging to the institution. One is that uh, we wanted to honor the UN's working definition of indigenous peoples. And it's really important to note that it's only a working definition because I think anytime you pin something, it, it's, it's always going to start to kind of fall apart a bit. So we thought a lot about the agency and self-definition as well as some of the pitfalls of that. We wanted to work with artists who were outright kind of challenging the possible essentialism uh, contained within, possibly contained within indigenous identity. So people identified themselves by, by nations, their, their definition, and also where they're from, not, not the countries. Um, we enabled them to create new work. But one thing that became really interesting is that Sagahan opened in 2013. 2012 started the, the beginnings of a movement that was quite profound, originated with four Native women called Idle No More. And this movement was trying to hold the Canadian government accountable for various, um, you know, breaking agreements, uh, trying to do these omnibus bills in Parliament that would take away further road Indigenous rights. And it grew to be an international movement. However, um, one of the artists wanted to cite a statement and it, it, was a, it was a year of protest and a lot of those protests took place in Ottawa. And that's where the National Gallery is, capital of Canada. So she simply wanted to cite um, what some women had declared on Parliament Hill. They're women from her community, the Algonquin community, the artist is Nadia Muir, and to cite that as part of her label by her work that was a wampum. Uh, representation of a wampum belt, which is many people understand these as agreements, but also treaties, right? And um, it wasn't long after we submitted all of the label information uh, that that we we received a disclaimer. The gallery wanted to say that these words or these views did not necessarily represent the views of the National Gallery of Canada, and they wanted us to put that next to Nadia's work, and we. You know, of course, we spoke back to that, but we actually realized that we had limits to our agency. But then I think because of fear at the time, Canada was under uh, the leadership of Stephen Harper, a conservative prime minister, um, and had been um, receiving a lot of funding cuts uh, for the arts, you know, broadly, federally. Um, so afterwards, after that disclaimer, they actually put a disclaimer in front of the entire show itself. And to me, that was kind of fascinating because one, it actually revealed that we had real power in our words because they were a bit fearful of them. <laughs> and to me, that also showed that our voices were growing in strength 
And uh, we did, you know, as much as we could to, to call attention to that. They never took down the disclaimer, um, but I thought it was, you know, interesting evidence of, of that, so. Yeah, no, and it's it's always fascinating with a museum or or art institutions more broadly, uh, and include art artists themselves, right, or curators when when we're no longer allowed to pretend like we're neutral, you know, like that we're you know that and and so I think that's always a fascinating moment. Uh, so the fact that you were able to trigger it is is quite an accomplishment. Um, as well, it we explains kind of, the limits of tolerance, right? Yeah, yeah, especially in what is considered to be liberal tolerant groups of society, right, uh, which is often a false claim, as we know. Uh, you know, in terms of um, shifting gears a little bit, I would love to hear also, I, I think it's really important what you added of the how, how within this context, the networks and political as well as artistic networks were kind of the foundation for Sakahan. But as, as even with some of the causes that you listed, like if we think, for example, of the North Dakota pipeline, those were international solidarity movements as well as very totally rooted, you know, uh, native movements, right? Uh, but Jimmy Durham, as controversial as his name sometimes is, was representing American Indian movement at the United Nations. So it's definitely kind of this movement that, that, that was global. But so how did that type of network representation uh, reflect, did, did it overlap with the work you did at Documenta as part of the curatorial team? Because doc, that Documenta, Documenta 14, also had a lot of political claims, right? By linking to Athens and the radicality of Athens, some of that backfired, you know? So how, what would you say is, was there an overlapping concern of dealing with networks or do you see it as a completely different approach? Hmm. Well, when uh, Adam Simchek, the artistic director of Documenta 14, uh, when we first started to be in dialogue, one of the things that he asked me, and it was a really important question, he said, what do you think is the place for the Americas within this exhibition? And it's one that you know other curators had dealt with. And of course, the very beginnings of Documenta are invested in this question, right? Uh, Post-World War II exhibition. Um, and what I was thinking about, in fact, is they might be a kind of mirror and reflection. And I was thinking actually about, of course, you know, that rupture when, uh, when Europe officially entered through, through Columbus, you know, into the, into the new world and how all of a sudden the idea that the globe was divided was no longer true. But then I was thinking about all these other ways that these kind of links were there, like one, the idea of the wealth of indigenous peoples really fueling, you know, the development of the Renaissance and people forget this. And also then, you know, for a more, a more uh, art historical example would be how the surrealists were looking to very specifically, you know, along with um, the things like mass and other, other things that were, came from cultural belongings that came from Africa, they were distinctly also looking at Northwest Coast art as well as um, Inupiaq uh, masks. And I thought that this was kind of a fascinating relationship because this showed how important indigenous art was to the development of European modernism, right? And, but what was happening, you know, at that moment is that there was a, there were all the kind of misconceptions or the projections, let's say, of what they thought these masks might represent because they didn't know. So they would, you know, value them based on their aesthetics or, or what they thought might offer was a kind of way out of their, their, you know, burgeoning industrial culture. And for me, that was why it was also important to include um, artists like Bodick, but also uh, the weavings of Mary Lou Schultz, who's a Navajo weaver living very close here uh, in Northern Arizona. And, you know, her work in representation, representing um, computer chip te technologies with weaving, for example, and based on, you know, in my mind, uh, actually the production of computer chips on Navajo Nation that was in the 60s with Fairchild Industries. So what I really saw was an opportunity to kind of expose these connections. I didn't want to, I, I was aware of the pitfalls and one of those pitfalls might be that indigenous art within that context, even though 
uh, Okui's documenta had included uh, folks like Isuma, for example, um, would be merely seen as radically other, right? Because there would be no kind of context for understanding this cultural production. Um, so I guess in, as a way to answer your question about the network, it was more about creating these tethers, um, these relationships that uh, were perhaps like a little floating beneath the surface a bit or, or or part of art history, but we thought that we knew that history and in fact we didn't. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's a it's a great formulation, and and uh, and and I, I think in itself the fact that you were asked this question with your trajectory means a shift of those very institutions, right? The, the, the who gets to be asked uh, what America, what the role of the continent should be, you know, is as important as asking the question, you know. So I I, I was really glad to see that you took that role. Uh, and what you did with it, you know, uh, given the the limited time, I want to make sure we also shift kind of towards the conversation with with Shambhavi. Uh, the last question I have for you has to do with with, of course, the pandemic, right? But also uh, white supremacy and so many other things that we're confronting uh, in our time, uh, certainly in the U.S., but I would say globally, right? The pandemic, of course, has put artists' livelihood at risk, uh, so-called essential workers are in their large majority, you know, black, brown and indigenous, you know. And so within that context, uh, how, how has your work been forced to reinvent itself, both as a curator of a biennial that is in process, you know, but also more broadly, like life in general, like uh, I think it would be great to hear. Uh, it's a question I've asked every guest so far and will ask uh, all in the series because I think it's an important question to ask at the moment. Yeah, well, uh, Pedro, you probably know, you know, the context of working, of me working in New Mexico. Uh, my husband is, is from the Navajo Nation and the and Indigenous people, as we know now in the U.S. at least, you know, are, are actually the highest affected from COVID and also the deaths. And my mother-in-law is a doctor. She's a former um, Surgeon General of Navajo Nation. And when she was there, they did a lot of pandemic training, thankfully. Um, but of course, at the initial stages of the pandemic, it was, it was looked like a horror show in, in a way, in the way that it was, you know, exposing as all of these inequities. Um, now, thankfully, if Navajo Nation was a country, it would be fourth in the world leading in vaccination rates, which mm -hmm. is also, I think, a kind of profound shift and turn uh, within this story. So. For, on one hand, it, uh, uh, it got me thinking even more so about, you know, how it revealed these disparities. But on the other hand, you know, this past summer was the summer of protest, right? It was, it gave me so much hope that we were able to ask these questions and that they were being taken in a serious manner. And here, you know, the questions, in Albuquerque were of course, you know, centered on, on white supremacy and the responses were largely from uh, black folks but also indigenous folks. And there's a group here called Raid Nation that organized a lot of events. Um, but where it really came to a head uh, for us was actually a very personal story when um, I had written and I have written quite a bit about uh, colonial monu monuments in particular those of conquistadors. Uh, they proliferate here in New Mexico, almost like an infection, particularly that of uh, Juan de Oñate, who was the first governor of New Mexico, Spanish governor. And um, the summer on June 16th, a friend of ours, who's an MA student in museum studies at um, uh, University of New Mexico uh, was shot four times at, a, at point blank range by a guy who had made a failed run for city councilor here in Albuquerque, his name's Stephen Ray Baca, uh, because he, Stephen felt like he was defending the monument. Uh, Scott thankfully survived, my husband witnessed it. Uh, most of our friends witnessed it. And, you know, the interesting thing is how, how we responded to that. It's almost as though like that, the Oñate monuments are an interesting case study. You know, that in 1997, uh, a guy who, and this is his own, moniker, the foot thief, cut off one of the feet of the monument as a way to remind people of Oñate's own violence of cutting off the feet of, of Pueblo men, particularly at Acoma, in retaliation for 
what he thought were um, you know, crimes against the Spanish government. Um, so people had largely forgotten that. And that was a rupture, you know, to get back to your initial point about historical amnesia, that was a rupture. In the summer, there was another rupture because many people, of course, didn't want these monuments to come down. Many insisted that they could only, they had to come down now. And so I think that this kind of, the space that's been made for this, for the dialogues, for the serious dialogues, the fact that the city, has taken you know, both of the major ones down. However, they said they took them down for their own safekeeping. They didn't say that they've taken them down and they'll forever you know, be, be in storage or destroyed. Um, so I think that we have space actually right now and perhaps the pandemic afforded that. We have space to speak back differently and I think many people are. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, there's an interesting recent essay by Nick Mirsov that connects directly the the summer protests, the bringing down of monuments with the insurrection and the, the deaths and the, the violent attack that put lives at risk, which not, you know, like the completely other side of the story, right? Of, of these white supremacists uh, uh, attacking the capital and putting our representatives' lives at risk, you know, like it's, uh, right. and uh, as a counterinsurgency of sorts, you know, or paramilitary coups or, you know, uh, so, but kind of to not to not drop the ball on art entirely, you know. I mean, of course, you put you put a lot of these questions and research always into amazing art for anybody who has seen the exhibitions you put together. But, but so how? What? What? Where is the the Toronto Biennial at? Like, right. I think that some of our audience would love to hear a little bit more, and then I'll I'll, I'll move it to Shambhavi for sure. So, um, of course, all you can do in this time is is kind of continue working, right? So we're continuing to work with artists. The Toronto Biennial is a commission, largely commissioning biennial, so we produce new works. We also wanted to make this distinct connection between the two editions. Uh, so we are working with a number of the artists that we worked with in the first year. Some of their work is actually unfolding in chapters in the case of Susan Shupley and also Shazad Dawood and his Leviathan project. Um, and that's a really fascinating process because usually the time frame of biennials are so short, you literally have only a year to do it. Artists only have a year, it's a pressure cooker. Um, now we have a little bit, we're, we're afforded some time to think together with them. And we'll have an announcement soon because um, we, we're looking very seriously at the dates uh, and even 2021 poses some challenges of course. So we're, we're thinking through that at the moment, um, thinking through, you know, how it's a biennial that continues to engage with historical geographies. It was initiated on the shoreline of Toronto and it, the first edition was called the Shoreline Dilemma. And the title came from the fact that, and this was really interesting that you can't actually accurately quantify shorelines. You can't measure them because they're fractal. Um, so we, we kind of took that as a larger metaphor of, of refusal of land actually and water kind of refusing this. And the fact that the shoreline was also the most heavily developed part supposedly in North America uh, is the Toronto shoreline, which might change with you know the Hudson Yards and things like that in New York. Um, so now we're continuing, I think, what is a kind of discussion with artists about not only ecologies, but of course, um, thinking about all of the layers or the kind of strata of history that the city has. One of our first gestures, and this was initiated by Ilana Shamoon, who's our director of programs, was to commission an artist, scholar, and uh, theater director, Ange Loft, who's Mohawk, um, to develop what's called the Indigenous Context Brief of Toronto. This, we call this a kind of public document. It was shared already to, with uh, all of the artists and met with all of the artists. We thought that it was incredibly important if we were bringing people to Toronto and also for those living there, that we provide some kind of deeper understanding of the place. So that will continue. We're commissioning another artist now, uh, Camille Turner, to add another strata to that context brief, looking at Black histories in, in Toronto and outside. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, and, you know, very soon people will be able to see, see all of this stuff, you know, 
And uh, well, I'll, I'll, I want to make sure we have time for Shambhavi to also talk to you a little bit and ask some questions and make comments. And then everyone should know that we will have 10 to 15 minutes of the audience also adding comments and questions. And uh, one of the aspects of the series that we also have is that if other guests, you know, other curators who, who are joining the series may at one point you know, join in the blast part. So if any of you are our guests, uh, let us know and we, we are happy to make your, turn your camera on for the last part if you want to. Uh, but right now we're gonna keep just, uh, uh, you know, Candice's and Shambhavi's on, uh, okay? Okay, well, Candice, thank you so much. That was uh, so interesting. I have, I have a couple of questions uh, that, I, that um, I'm curious to hear your response to. Um, uh, really interested in this idea of indigenous art as a global global movement and also thinking about the sort of international nature of biennales. And I guess I, uh, uh, I would be curious to hear if you see some potential in, in the idea of, uh, of this kind of global network to include um, other displaced and dispossessed groups, um, you know, through art, I guess. Yeah. That's a great question and thank you for it because I do. <laughs> I, definitely <Yeah>. see, <laughs> I definitely see that that um, that potential. And I think that now we're learning more than ever, not only about each other's histories, but also uh, resistant movements. And you know, this might take us a little bit of the art discussion, but I hope to bring it back to that. Like it, one thing that really inspired me was thinking about the no D pale movement uh, in Standing Rock um, mm. and uh, my husband and sister-in-law, uh, Autumn Chacon, Raven Chacon both spent time there, Autumn in fact six months and Raven two weeks. Um, and there, there was, I think again, kind of similar to the 60s, a kind of uh, idea of like a kind of uh, alliances that can be formed. So Black Lives Matter, were there members of that movement um, learning from each other about you know, how to create a platform for this that would resonate broadly internationally. Um, when Raven was there, he said that he felt like that might be one possibility to, for the future because he felt like it was the first time he had been in what was really, truly a kind of indigenous defined space. It was a temporary thing, of course, mm -hmm. uh, it was a temporary movement that very quickly became international with lots of allies um, from all over and both indigenous allies and, and non-indigenous allies. And I think that there's a lot to learn in that. I think that there's a lot to learn in the improvisation of those movements. Mm -hmm. We ended up actually co-authoring a score called Dispatch that was based on the analysis of who was there, what roles they were performing, and whether this might be a kind of framework for other kinds of action. So it was a way to think about the role of art, but also the political role of sound, which is something that's that we've both been thinking through a lot lately. So mm -hmm. the idea that you know one of the outcomes of that score might be sonic fragments, you know, is interesting. And I think that is, you know, something that that might resonate. Uh, but all that to say that I think this is already happening. I, I think that this is happening. And one of the kind of effects or the resonances, let's say, the more insidious ones of white supremacy is to um, divide us, right? And one of the ways that we can sort of work against that is to come together, you know? And um, you know, I think that there's something possible within what I call kind of like sounding the margins. So bringing together uh, people who might have been, you know, very forcibly dispossessed, uh, but we're never dispossessed in our ideas, right? So. Well, sort of related to that, it makes me think of uh, when you said temporary movements and improvisations, but also thinking of biennales themselves as these, um, in the last, for weeks we've been talking to other curators and this sort of theme comes up of how biennales are sort of occupations of cities, occupations of spaces. But then it made me think through what you just said that you know maybe there's a potential to think of it as a kind of, even if it's temporary, a kind of reoccupation of space, um, you know, of, of land even. Um, yeah. And I, I thought of like, um, you know, Zach Khalil once saying that, uh, uh, um, that the way to put, put you know, um, 
substance behind the land acknowledgement is to is to pay rent. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I just I just I, I wonder whether I guess I'm curious to as a as a as a curator of biennales, if you see some sort of potential in this temporary reoccupation of space and whether, you know, I mean I'm sure you do, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, that's such a good question. I'm glad that you also brought up Zach Kalu, who's a yeah. member of um, a really great collective called New Red Order. We worked with them for the last Toronto Biennial. But what I wanted to say in response to that was, um, of course, uh, as many people know, um, Documenta 14 was criticized, particularly in Athens, for being a kind of form of neocolonialism. Mm -hmm. And it's a charge that was really hard to hear, but I think also quite necessary, right? And, and I think it was very, very important that it was raised. It got me thinking about, of course, not only the rights of people, but the rights to land, uh, whether people want, you know, these large exhibitions to kind of descend on them, which I think, you know, it felt like that for, for a lot of folks. Uh, one thing that uh, Pedro knows very well is one of the first things that, that I did as part of Documenta before it opened was um, to run with Claire Butcher, who's now joined us with the Toronto Biennial, a school. Um, it was called the School of Listening. And when I originally proposed this as part of my proposal for Documenta 14, uh, then as a, as a um, curatorial advisor, was that this was a school led by artists, composers, uh, sound scholars for the curators of Documenta 14. Um, some of those curators took part, of course, and they also were instructors, uh, but we were thinking a lot about the potential of, of resonances, of whether it might be possible to kind of not only practice the form of deep listening, to borrow a term from Paul Milleros, but to listen beyond. How do you listen beyond colonial resonances to something else? Because this hum, uh, as a friend of mine, Dylan Robinson says, can be really, really pervasive. Mm -hmm. So we thought about, you know, uh, the radical potential of different kinds of tunings uh, and composers like Guillermo Galindo taught, it, or taught us this, in fact. Um, and I really think it was because of that start for me anyway, and that kind of grounding in sound and resonance and listening uh, that it changed uh, the way that I worked as part of that exhibition and, and changed the, the way I think a lot of artists approached it as well. Um, so I think that it, with that to say, one, one of the things that I think a lot about is, you know, how do we give agency to not just people in a place, but the place itself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of my questions was, you know, oftentimes Greece is thought of for many people outside as to be full of these rich ruins. So my thought was like, how do we actually listen to to the resonances of those ruins, given that we're kind of at that moment in time when we are working, it was really an experience of not only mm -hmm. the ruins of capitalist failure um, mm -hmm. because of the great debt and how that was being perceived, especially from European nations in the North, um, but also of course, um, the crisis that was taking place, a human rights crisis with uh, migrants and refugees as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So should I keep going or do you want to um, open Well, up? I think, let, how time. about, um, I, I will bring in some questions from the audience and then Shamba, if you have other questions, you can throw them in, right? Yeah. But that way people uh, do have a sense that, that, that you know, Candice can, you can choose how long you want to go. So then, then we will have plenty of time because we still have 20 minutes. So it'll actually, okay. it'll be a luxury in this session. You know, in previous sessions, we have to rush with that part. Um, so, um, so I, I'll just kind of, um, bring up like uh, Helen Colton asks Candice if Edward Glissant's, you know, concepts and ideas, specifically the idea of, of the archipelagic thinking had an influence on you, you know, as, as, you, as you address your curatorial practice, but also your scholarship. And Christopher Green also asked you Candice whether, you know, given the fact that biennials have historically been predominantly located in met major metropolitan centers, how you think this, um, the intertwined project of decolonization and de-imperialization when curating, you know, connect to this issue of, of, lo of location, right? Uh, that is so highly concentrated on these contested sites uh, of imperial power. Mm -hmm. And the last question currently up, which I'll stop there, 
is from Edu Fernandez. Uh, and it basically asks that uh, it's alarming in the, this is how it's uh, written, that how many Western universities use the others as their subject of study, ignoring like for in sciences like anthropology and confusing cultural manifestations with scientific evidence. Um, and whether this is uh, evidence of a postmodern academy and it's a blank check to well-to-do elites. So I will stop with those. There's other, other questions being dropped in. So you feel free to answer as you wish, okay? Great questions. Uh, thank you, Helen, Christopher, and Edu. Um, I guess I'll start with Helen's, uh, particularly for the Toronto Biennial, I think Glissant's ideas were not only of influence to us and, and, and my co-curator, Tyrone Bastian, but also to many of the artists um, who cited him you know, very openly. Uh, for me, I think a lot of the thinking that I was working with was also thinking through how a lot of um, Black theorists were thinking about relationality as well, in addition to Glissant, um, particularly uh, how Relationality is also a form of resistance, like I would cite um, Under Commons by Fred Moten and Stefano Harney as one example of that. Also their idea that within that, uh, there's room for noise and dissonance, right? Um, and so, so they, they've been definitely people who've, who have um, inspired me as well as um, a really great little book called A Billion Black Anthropocenes. Uh, which really looks at the, the kind of who was left out of this kind of current historicization of what the Anthropocene is, and it tends to be, you know, people of color. Um, Chris, uh, your question was about how biennials are historically, they are, you know, let's say, predominantly located in, in major metropolitan centers, um, thinking through the intertwined projects of decolonization, deimperialization, de Deimperialization when curating. Um, that's a, such a great question because, in fact, I had never thought about that necessary link between decolonial and deimperial projects as needing to be contingent and take place together until I had heard a talk by you, Chris, um, when you were still a PhD student. And because of that, it got me down a rabbit hole of really looking at uh, reading closely many, many times Edward Said's book on, on imperialism, uh, which I think is a vital text because what he speaks about is how imperialism kind of puts in motion a sense of inertia. And so that's like the, what he calls profit and the hope of future profit. So when I read that, it made me realize that, you know, the col colonial project is always already tethered to the imperial one, but it also is an example as to why we have this insatiable need for resources. So why does that keep that cycle keep, why can't we learn from that, for example, and why do we need to keep resisting this? So in relation to, to Toronto, it was an opportunity to think deeper about um, what resources we're, we're using, where they come from, how we can have a lighter ecological footprint, let's say, how right from the beginning, um, actually making a statement, and this was something that I, I learned really through working on the site Santa Fe biennials, a statement thinking about and centering for us the rights of artists. Um, and that's something that's really come I think to the fore, of course, during the pandemic as well, you know, what if an artist is only paid on the delivery of their work, but the exhibition never happens yet they did all the research, you know, how do we reframe that? Another thing I think that was a, of course, a decolonial gesture is this authoring of the indigenous context brief for Toronto, which when we shared that with officials at the city, it was kind of funny because they said, we never thought of doing that. You know, we never thought of actually radically reshaping the way that we narrate the history of this place. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that some of these things actually then sort of feed into what might be perhaps some small steps towards a more decolonial view of an exhibition. And of course, we talked about this a ton through Documenta, and I think the critics of Documenta 14 have contributed to this thinking greatly too. So I want to acknowledge their work as well. Yeah, and also, so I'll, I'll add a few more notes from the questions and, and Shambhavi, please, please jump in as, as if you have other comments or questions. Mm -hmm. 
One is a, a, a greeting or shout out from, from uh, Carolyn Christopher Karkiev says, hi. Uh, Carolyn will actually be in this, she's in the series a, a couple of weeks from now. So I think this, this uh, topic of Documenta is kind of an ongoing thread, of course, as it, as it should be in, in the series, but also uh, when, 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 when she visits, we can talk more about the, the, the decision of Kabul, you know, and in your case, you worked with Athens, you know, in her Documenta, Documenta 13, Kabul was, was a really important addition. Uh, and uh, so, so we look forward to that conversation. Uh, but uh, sh um, there's two more questions. One is from our, our, one of our uh, PhD students here at Duke, uh, Elizabeth Brown. And she's asking you, like, what do you think are the conditions that absolutely have to change in museums and galleries to even begin to address anti-racism and more parity for Black artists and people of, indi you know, Indigenous artists and, and people of color more broadly? Uh, and Sophie Giblin asks, uh, thanks you for the talk, and asks if you can talk about sound, how the sound voice has the ability to reveal historical truths. I'll leave it there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Elizabeth and, and Sophie, for those two questions. Well, Elizabeth, the way that I would start is um, I think a lot about repatriation and reparations and also restitution, of course. Um, I think that we're living in a moment where we are increasingly holding institutions accountable, not only on racist hiring practices and structures, but one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is that possibly, possibly, if there's a will, we can counter systemic racism in institutions with systemic hiring, right? Um, because I think oftentimes the way that institutions signal their change is either through what they've collected or what they've exhibited, mm -hmm. um, but often not deeper. Uh, so I think that there, there are deeper analyses happening at the moment, but I also think with regards to Indigenous people, um, collections are actually one of the greatest sources of violence um, because museums signal uh, their wealth through those things that they have in their holdings. The majority of those cultural belongings, and I don't wanna use the word uh, artifact here because I like to use cultural belongings because it shows that they have another home that's not necessarily within that museum. It also shows that they're things of agency. And um, Pedro, you know this well through your work uh, with the black mirrors and the mess. Um, so one thing that I that I think of think about as well is how we might think of repatriation in a more expanded sense or even otherwise. Um, and there's artists who are doing this. Uh, one uh, who is part of our exhibition called Soundings, an exhibition in five parts, is Tanya Lukin Linklater. Tanya is um, a Lutik and Clinket, originally from Kodiak Island. Uh, she's a choreographer, and recently she she did something that I think is quite profound. Um, she worked with a seal gut parka that's in the collection of the Manitoba Museum of Man. Of course, like many of these um, objects, they don't know the name of the maker, but of course they know everything about the collector, the person who donated it to them, and they tend to be white men. Um, so she went and visited with the parka for about three days. She asked its permission to, to move it. She tried to learn from it by this idea of being proximate to it. And then that parka formed the basis of a series of new choreographies and score that was uh, played by Laura Ortman, uh, an amazing Apache violinist. So it, it got me thinking that, you know, perhaps through this sense of embodiment, there can also be a kind of form of repatriation. Maybe we can think of it in the expanded sense that it's also about getting our things back, but not that's not the only thing that we need to focus on. Um, one of the questions that I had lately and I raised in social media is that there seems to be a lot of um, virtue signaling from institutions right now about all the diversity training they're undertaking and equity training, for example, especially at contemporary museums. But my question is, especially for those who are interested or collecting indigenous art is, where are the indigenous curators? We're still hired as guest curators if we're hired at all, and we still work as unpaid consultants. Um, so I recognize that space is being made, but if it's just space being made, then that doesn't mean that there's actually been any systemic change. It is also too often, I believe, um, assumed uh, that even when there is a hire, that those curators can only curate within their ghettos, right? Like if you're, 
if so, if you're the 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 Latino curator they hired, or if you're the indigenous, you know, the native curator, then you can you can't curate a show that that doesn't have a majority. You know, uh, sometimes you're even required to only have artists of that group. Yeah. You know, which they would never ask a white curator to only curate. I mean, they do often only curate white <laughs> male artists. You know, but they, <laughs> but it's not one of the rules they are given. You know. Maybe, you know, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe exactly. it is in the, in, in the fine print. <laughs> yeah, it's super bringing that up. And the other Shambhavi, thing I was I mean, noticing. I'm, I'm curious oh, also how, how you see like Shamba, because this is this is such a global question, right? Of course, yeah. it, it impacts uh, cultural belongings of, of indigenous and native uh, First Nations and so on. But, but uh, for example, in South Asia, the cultural practices from, from the globe are so different at times from what Western institutions have recognized as what is worth preserving and collecting, yeah. you know? And so, so how do you see kind of uh, artists navigate that? Um, yeah, and, and I'm also just curious from the point of view of being a contemporary art curator, you know, like what kinds of interventions in what counts as contemporary art? Like how does this also affect that, you know? Hmm. Yeah, I think, Maybe Pedro, do you do you mind reframing that a little bit because I got distracted by a question that was coming yeah, up? Yeah, no, I think <laughs> well the, the 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 question, and then I will look at the the ones from the audience, and I'll, I'll shut up. But <laughs> the I I was trying to bridge with with um, and asking Shambhavi, you know, perhaps also to reflect back on what you're saying because the the it's a global issue, right? This 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 disconnect between Western institutions and what they recognize as objects to be collected, even within contemporary practice, and what are uh, sometimes traditions that go back millennia or centuries, mm -hmm. but sometimes new practices that come from a context that where that it makes no sense. And to, mm -hmm. to yeah. um, I will, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think that that was very much at the heart of a lot of the research I've done about how, uh, potlatch objects came to be mm -hmm. in the holdings of, of museums and also contemporary galleries and also the foundation of the Northwest Coast Collection at the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, and these were things that were taken under duress or were or had to be sold under the threat of jail because it was it was a real ban. People went to jail, they faced fines, they had their things taken away. Um, but part of what the reasoning for that, I believe, is because those items were the basis also of an alternative form of governance. And also not only that, but the understanding of wealth. So that was very threatening to Western and colonial authorities. So they, so it sh goes to show that these things, these things that are held in museums are also our documents, are there also our legal systems, are also our forms of justice. Mm -hmm. uh, they're really not simply objects, but they, they realized actually the strength in divorcing us from them. And I think this continues, right? And so that's also, I think, at the heart of um, some movements to, to speak back to, to museums and also to reframe, you know, what is the very reason why they wanted to collect them in the first place? Who did they want to show them to, right? Like it's, I think that these are super important questions to to raise even now. Yeah, and and also, what are the different ways to preserve culture, right? If we want memory, because you started, we started the session with you with you talking about amnesia and how biennials can reinforce amnesia if they don't build memory making into their very mechanisms, right? And and so I think this is a really important question. Mm -hmm. um, I will add just three more things from from the from the Q and A, and then we can end it with that. You can address with the one. One is more of a comment from Usha Sijarim, which has to do with she loves the focus of, of sound and listening and resonance. Minus Plato is asking a question, which uh, education is also a recurrent theme already in this series, not just because we're organizing it through a university, but I think because people recognize that biennials are an opportunity to educate on issues that it sometimes takes museums much longer to do so. So, my, uh, you know, uh, I think Minas wants you to talk a little bit about that connection. So, and, and there's a specific, specific example of like how Jamie Moore's educator for indigenous programs and outreach brings experience from Sakahan, you know, and uh, about the cone into the general work at the National Gallery of Canada, you know, like if, if biennials can also serve that function, you know, of, of mm -hmm. educating institutions that have a longer, you know, uh, shelf life of sorts. Uh, and then Miguel Rojas also asked if you could talk a little bit more 
about the at times problematic or contentious um, dialogue that certainly was active in, in Athens uh, for document the 14 between the radical left and indigenous movements worldwide. You know, uh, I mean, the, the, of course, North Dakota pipeline is another. There's so many examples where that the tensions between these two uh, movements can can be felt. Uh, so, yeah. So to address uh, uh, minus Plato's question first, um, thinking through education, um, one of the things that I think about as a curator are the kind of existing hierarchies within our own practices and ones which we tend to take for granted. Um, one of the things that uh, we did as part of Documenta 14 is not to begin with the exhibition, but actually to begin with the public programs. And those were launched in November, the year before uh, the exhibition opened in, in April in, in Athens. Um, so to think through the idea that it shouldn't be education and programs that are developed out of the exhibition, but perhaps there's an opportunity for them to lead. And that's a question that we've carried forward through for the Toronto Biennial of Art and Claire Butcher, who was with with Documenta has joined us there with also Myung Sun Kim. And this year, we are really quite strict about articulating ourselves as a team of five, rather than the people who work on the exhibition and the people who work on public programs and exhibitions. Also, so that we develop everything collaboratively, we often do uh, you know, studio visits with artists together. Um, we write together, we're doing a lot of co-authorship at the moment, including co-authoring a lexicon that we've been releasing, you know, over time, we've done it through the first press release and we'll do it again on the third one and eventually publish this. But thinking about, you know, the words and phrases that are leading us or guiding us and Claire brought one forward that was really important. And she, she said that the root of conspire actually is to breathe together, which I thought was really interesting, especially in the context of the pandemic. So we've been thinking about that kind of idea of collectivity. And interestingly as well, in the, in the model of the Toronto Biennial, or I think it's interesting, um, us as curators, you know, we'll leave after this next edition, but the education curators have the opportunity to remain on if they want to, um, to continue that kind of work that they've done understanding that the kind of community building or relationships that they're doing, let's say, uh, take a long time. And it's not always very sustainable if you're interrupting this every time, especially if someone's created all these relationships with the school board and then there's a new person and you're kind of starting back from the point of zero. So, so that's one thing that we're thinking through to kind of address that question. And then the other, which was talking about the kind of contentious at times relationship between uh, indigenous artists and also the radical left is a really important one, I think. I think in some ways it was the result of some misconceptions, uh, misconceptions perhaps about maybe even how artists were defining themselves as indigenous and perhaps even misconceptions about how Indigenous artists are actually at the forefront of decolonial movements. So there's the opportunity for, to learn from one another, right? Um, and I think that that perhaps started happening, um, but I also really recognize the role of the radical left to, um, to criticize and to speak back. You know, this, this took place a lot in the kind of vernacular of the street. So through graffiti and things like that, which is already, you know, language that is well known in Athens. And one of the first stencils that was put outside the documental office was first in Greek and then they, you know, it was intelligent because then they switched it to English, understanding that was our working language for the most part, even though, you know, more than half the team was, was Greek. But it was uh, along the lines of how they weren't going to become our cultural capital. And it was a really important critique, kind of neo-colonial one as well, and the kind of insidious nature of, of neo-colonialism. Um, but yeah, I would I would say that yeah, there were there were kind of misconceptions on on many sides. And it's kind of hard to bridge those sometimes when people aren't opening open to hearing one another. So I'll just say that. And it's also a very old misconception, right? Like they're my, one of my favorite Mexican, you know, 
political theorist is Guillermo Benfield Batalla, and he wrote about how one of the major failures of even the Mexican Revolution and throughout was this inability of leftists to understand that Mexico is for, first and foremost an indigenous country, you know, <laughs> and, and that they have completely, you know, that this population has been ignored and, uh, and it's sim simply seen as a proletarian. I mean, the Zapatista uprising, of course, changed that dramatically, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, but Shambhavi, I want to make sure you get, if you still have a, a yeah, final question or comment, you know, since we're nearing yeah. the end of our conversation. Yeah, this is, this is great. Thank you. I feel well, like my, my questions are getting answered as, as <laughs> come up in my head. <laughs> well, and thanks so much, uh, Candice. You know, since we have collaborated before in the Art of the MOOC series, I know you're an amazing educator, even though like, I think one of the, the Magnus's question has to do with also Often, too often we assume universities can't play a, a role, right, in biennials and in museums and so on. And of course they can. There's so many great, if, for example, if, we all, if we've known for decades in the U.S. that the best radio stations or a lot of the best are university radio stations, why can't the best museums or some of the best museums be university museums? Or why can't universities play a, a very, much more active function uh, in, in biennial. So I was really happy to see, for example, when Joan Jonas represented the U.S. Uh, for, uh, at its pavilion in Venice, that MIT, you know, was heavily involved in that production. And I think that's something we should and can expect from universities, rather than only have galleries uh, be involved in that type of process, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah. so I know the, th the three of us kind of agree on this, but I'm, I hope this series will help constitute a larger international group of, of like-minded people for that. Um, yeah, absolutely. And thank you, of course, for the great dialogue as always to both of you. Thank thanks, you. and uh, we'll be in touch. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Take care.